Well, hey, friends, welcome to Vintage Truth. I'm Jeff Kinley, and I'm so glad you've joined me today. Hey, listen, before we hop into our study uh, in God's Word today, I want to tell you this Prophecy Pros pop-in conference that I've told you about before is just exploding. We had uh, hundreds upon hundreds of people uh, on the wait list uh, for this thing. It's a conference you can watch from your own home, uh, just sitting at your kitchen counter or, or uh, on the couch or whatever, but go to prophecyprosconference.online, prophecyprosconference.online. Online, and you can register for this for this incredible, unique, one of a kind conference. And the thing that makes it so fun is that not only can you watch it from your own home, but we're going to teach you how to be an end times influencer for Jesus Christ. Uh, you know that we use that term influencer. We're going to toss it around. People are influencers on social media, Instagram, places like that. But we want you to be an end times <clears throat> influencer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to teach you exactly how you can do that. So don't miss it. Go there right now. Uh, and register for this incredible conference. It's going to be on January the 6th uh, on, a, I think it's 7 o'clock in the evening, uh, 6 or 7 in the evening. But you can find out more on the website, uh, prophecyprosconference.online. And by the way, I've been doing a lot of TV, a lot of radio about this uh, recent uh, war in Israel and just giving a biblical perspective on things uh, as well. So I did an incredible interview on CBN. Just type in CBN, Jeff Kinley. And an interview I did a couple weeks ago with Billy Hollowell, uh, that thing is way over 900,000 views uh, on this thing. It's gone completely viral. So it'll eventually hit a million views. But all that to say is that people are just simply interested. They want to know, uh, what does the Bible say? And so we want to help you uh, uh, understand that as best as possible. So uh, for more information about what's going on in the ministry, go to jeffkinley.com. And don't forget to catch me uh, on the King is Coming television program. Uh, I'm on there teaching every week now and uh, teaching you from, straight from God's Word uh, on issues related to Bible prophecy, uh, what the Bible says about the end times, what the Bible says about America, about biblical discernment, about the days of Noah, uh, about uh, the bride of Christ. Uh, we're covering all those things, and we're adding a new feature that we'll have uh, towards the, the, the end of this year, uh, a question and answer time. It's just ask Jeff Kinley your Bible questions. And so uh, you can go to the King is coming.com the king is coming.com and you can send me uh, your questions and uh, God willing we'll be able to answer as many of those as possible the ones I can't answer on the uh, the, the TV show uh, we're going to be creating some special spots uh, on our Instagram uh, and TikTok uh, accounts I'll give you more information about that as we go along for the king is coming and I'm going to be addressing a lot of those questions there okay so we're going to get into John 17 uh, we're in this uh, extended study on the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ and, and this thing is so it's so rich it's just dripping with theology there's so much there that's you know, all of theology is practical, my friend. If anyone ever teaches you theology and you're yawning or you're falling asleep, then they're not doing it right because theology is the most exciting thing in the whole world. Uh, knowing about God, studying about God, and in this incredible prayer uh, that Jesus Christ gives us, we learn a lot about God, about God, not only who God is, about the relationship between the Son and the Father, but also about how he feels about you and me and what his will is for you and me. You know, sometimes we get asked the question, well, what's God's will for my life? How do I, how do I understand God's will for my life? There's so much of God's will is spelled out specifically, clearly, word for word in the Bible. And I have found in my own life is that if I will just follow the things that I do know, that God has told me, the things that I don't know will become clear to me as I go about doing the things that God has already told me to do. And right now, I'm praying through some things right now that in my own life, God, do you want, should I do that? Of course, I'm involving my wife in this because she's the other two thirds of my brain. That's a shout out to my wife there. <laughs> but she's always there to give wise counsel to me. But watch this. This is what's so amazing about God is that God wants us to know. And when the things that we can't know for whatever reason, God wants us to trust. So I'm praying through right now some very, very big things about my life that are all exciting. 
and uh, the Lord has led me to uh, to assume the teaching role and the hosting role. The King is Coming television program, I'm doing that. I'm also in the midst of, uh, I'm in the doctoral program, uh, studying for my doctorate right now uh, at Liberty University. And so I'm in the midst of doing that as well. Uh, and so I'm, tra I'm traveling, I'm speaking, I'm teaching a Wednesday night Bible study here locally. Uh, I'm uh, in the process of, of writing books. I'm doing a lot of things, but I know that as I continue to follow what God wants me to do, that that the things I don't know about will be made clear. Well, there's something today that Jesus wants you to know that is crystal clear. And there's no ambiguity, there's no vagueness, there's no fogginess, uh, there's no uh, confusion. It's very simple. And he tells it to us in John 17. Again, we're in the high priestly prayer. Uh, Jesus has just prayed uh, to the Father to sanctify us in the truth, because his word is truth. Uh, we talked about last time, how Jesus wants you to be sanctified and exactly what that means. But notice he says now, he says next, he says, as you, Father, did send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now, what in the world <laughs> is Jesus talking about there? Well, how did Christ send the disciples uh, into the world? Well, we already know when we, when we see the, the, the Gospels here, we, we see when Christ first chose uh, his disciples, uh, he gave them uh, a commission uh, of sorts because they, you know, they, had to be, they had to follow Christ and, and learn from him. In fact, the word disciple uh, in its root means a follower, or excuse me, means a learner. A learner. A disciple is a learner. That's the primary characteristic and attribute of a Christian, really, is a learner. So think about that. The word disciple is used some 275 times throughout the New Testament. The word Christian is used three times. So the biblical word is disciple. Uh, the word that was given to us by those at Antioch is the word Christian, which just kind of means little Christ, but because they were making fun of us. But here's the thing is that God wants you to embrace your role as a disciple of his. And to be a disciple primarily means to learn. So any Christian uh, who is not constantly exposing him or herself to learning about God, about theology, about the Bible, uh, needs to question whether or not they're a genuine disciple. Any person, any person who claims to be a Christian uh, who doesn't want to be taught the Word of God, doesn't want anybody to teach them, doesn't want to learn the Word of God themselves by having a, a their own Bible and understanding what it means. My friend, you're denying the very essence of what it actually means to call yourself a Christian because a Christian is a disciple. And so every true disciple needs to be a learner. So when Jesus called his disciples in Mark chapter 3, it says here in verse uh, 13, And he went up to the mountain, and he summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And it says, And he appointed twelve that they may be with him. That's the number one reason God called you, is to be with him. The number one reason that you and I are disciples, is that we might have a relationship with God. That is, there's nothing that supersedes that. No kind of ministry, no kind of activity, uh, no kind of mission ever comes before our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's number one. But look what it says next. It says that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So the sending them out in the third thing, third tier there, is to have authority uh, to cast out the demons. This was to authenticate, by the way, uh, the fact that they were indeed sent from God, is that these early disciples uh, were accompanied by a, by a supernatural power uh, to cast out uh, the demons. But the thing I want to focus in on is that second phrase there, that he might send them out. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, Again, the essence of discipleship, be with Christ, learn from Christ. But eventually, a disciple is a, he's a learner, or she's a learner, a follower. That means our obedience to Christ. But we're also a reproducer or a multiplier as well. In other words, we want other people to also become disciples of Jesus Christ. And so over here in John 17, 
He says, as, uh, as Father, you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. So they were sent into the world, the disciples were from the very beginning, the very first day, actually, they became disciples, they became missionaries, uh, if you will. And Jesus relates this to the way in which the Father has sent him into the world. Now, you'll recall from the Gospels, and particularly the, the Gospel of John, that Jesus talked about his mission a lot. He talked about, for example, at, at the woman at the well, uh, when the disciples came and found him there talking to that woman, he says, he says, my food, my sustenance, my passion, my desire, my livelihood is to do the will of him who sent me. Uh, and Jesus repeated that over and over again uh, throughout uh, the Gospel of John that he is here. He is a man on mission, a man on mission. He's the God man. Obviously, he came to basically to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. And he also came, as John 1 tells us, to reveal God uh, to, to the world and to his disciples. So essentially, there's two things, a couple of things I want you to know about that is that number one is that Christ had a, a specificity to his mission. It wasn't really uh, broad in the sense that it had a, a bunch of moving parts to it. Uh, Jesus kept it simple. And I think we need to do the same. He came with a very simple yet powerful yet divine mission from the Father. That mission was to tell them about who God is, tell them the truth, reveal the truth, and then also to die for sin, uh, to, to, in essence, to give them the gospel, to show them the way uh, to the Father. Our job is very, very similar to that. Our job is to speak the truth, which presupposes that we know the truth, which presupposes that we are in the truth, right? So we got to be in the word in order for us to, to know the word. And then the more we become acquainted with the word of God, the more comfortable it becomes to us. And I don't mean comfortable in the sense that it doesn't convict us. I mean comfortable in the sense that it it's kind of second nature to our way of thinking. And I always relate it to uh, speaking a foreign language. You know, you, no one's born speaking two languages. I mean, you're born, you know, learning the language of your parents. And when I was in high school, uh, they told me that I had to take a foreign language to graduate. So I asked my friends, I said, well, which one's the easiest one? And they said, well, Spanish is the easiest one. I said, well, give me some Spanish then. So I took Spanish. What I did not know at the time was that from being just a musician, I was able to replicate sounds with, with, my, with my mouth and my guitar, but I did not know that that would serve me in studying foreign languages. And for whatever reason, the, the, lang the Spanish language came extremely natural and easy for me. And I was, I was making great grades. I was making all A's in, in Spanish. And uh, and because I wasn't making good grades in other subjects, so math was was a was a difficult subject for me. But but the languages were, were incredible, and I ended up winning the foreign language award, the Spanish award, at my high school when I graduated. Then I went on to to college. I studied Portuguese. I studied more. I majored in Spanish in college. I got a degree in Spanish, and then I I studied uh, Koine Greek uh, in class. Excuse me, classical Greek uh, in college. Then then I got to Dallas Theological Seminary. And was immersed into the Greek language and uh, studied Koine Greek, New Testament Greek, uh, for those four years I was there, and also Hebrew. Well, Hebrew wasn't quite as easy, but uh, but Greek, to me, came fairly easy, and, and I really loved it to this day. Now, don't come up to me at a conference and start speaking Spanish to me, because I might not catch it, because I don't get to practice that much these days, but, but I'll catch most of what you say, and I love to speak it because it's a beautiful language. But here's the point. The point is, the more you study a language and the more you practice that language, guess what? You start thinking in that language. Your mind actually begins to gear itself. You're not thinking about translating the, the English word. What is the word for beach? Oh, playa. Okay, what is the word for mother? Oh, madre. You don't think that. You just say it. And the more you and I are immersed in the truth of God, of, of God's word, you know what begins to happen? We begin to think Bible. We begin to think in the biblical language. We begin to think biblically. And that's part of what discernment is all about, is, is really just thinking biblically. And again, it's, it's sometimes you have to say, what does the Bible say? And then other times it just comes. I was telling my wife this morning, we were about to have our prayer time together. And, and I said to her, I said, you know, I get on these TV shows and these radio shows, and I have no idea what they're going to ask me most of the time. 
But I find that as they're asking the question, all of a sudden, into my mind is dropping all of these verses and passages in the Bible. Have I ever memorized those verses? No. Did I know I was supposed to have those verses ready? No. But they just came because I've just been in the Word. Now, I'll tell you this right now. I love being a learner of the Bible, and I have a lot to learn. You hear that? I have a lot to learn. 35 years as a pastor, four years at Dallas Seminary. I've written 40-something books, and I speak all over the world. You know what? I've got a lot to learn. I really do. And I love to learn. I'm in, I'm in a real kind of hunger stage right now, hunger season, where I'm trying to devour as much as I can because I just I love learning. Well, that's what a disciple should do. So that's the first thing. Uh, and, he, and the second thing he says uh, about uh, about Christ's mission, not only did he come to reveal God, but he came to, to share the gospel. He came to give them the gospel. Now, for Jesus, that meant dying on the cross. Now, he also shared it verbally, and he preached it, and he, he talked to it in small groups and with individuals as well. Uh, but he came to, to really incarnate the gospel uh, by dying on the cross for our sins. Now, God doesn't want you to die on the cross for anyone's sin, because you can't. Uh, someone needed to die for your sins and my sins. But here's what he wants us to do. He wants us to go into the world, to be sent in the world. In fact, that word sent there in, in verse 18 uh, is the word we get our word apostle from, apostle. And what it means is this, not that we're apostles, but it means that we are commissioned divinely commissioned by God. You do not need the permission of an elder board, a pastor, uh, a deacons, a, a diocese, whatever you're involved in in your church. You don't need anybody's permission to call yourself a missionary for Jesus Christ. Because right here in this verse, Jesus himself is already commissioning you. You are divinely ordained of God to be a witness of his. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a pastor. You, if you're going to be an official missionary from an organization or sent out from your church necessarily, you, you do, need, do need your pastor and your, your uh, board of elders to come around you and recognize that God's call is on your life. And that's what happened to me. I had, had my church leadership to recognize that here's this young 18-year-old boy, and he believes God's called him into ministry. And I went, I went before a lot of boards to, to share what that call meant, why I felt like I was called to God, uh, to full-time ministry, vocational ministry. But, and if you're going to be a missionary, you need the same thing. But in terms, in terms of official missionary, but in terms of being a witness for Christ, you don't need any of that. You just go be the witness that Christ has called you to, to be and to do. And, um, and so the word apostle means to be, to be sent or to be commissioned. And that's that word here that Jesus is using. The father commissioned the son. The son is now commissioning you. And that's why it's so exciting to be able to say, I'm a missionary to, and you name it. I'm a missionary to that school. I'm a missionary to that company. I'm a missionary to this neighborhood. I'm a missionary for some of you to your own family. I am a missionary. Now, what, what all does that entail? Well, I think one thing we see right here in the verse tells us exactly what it entails. It says, he says, I've also sent them into the world. He didn't say I've sent them into the church or into the synagogue, but into the world. Why? Because the world needs Jesus. That, that word cosmos, the world system that's out there. Uh, we talked about this a couple of verses earlier and a couple of podcasts ago that God wants you embedded into the world. You need to be embedded like a like a tick <laughs> into the world, so that so that you're a, a not not of the world uh, because you're of another world, but you're in the world. Uh, God doesn't want us to be removed from the world; He wants us to be in the world. And we don't adopt the practices of the world, the values of the world, the beliefs of the world. But God wants us to be in the world. So so Jesus said, "Go into the world." Uh, not not the the ivory tower. Get in there in the world and, and rub shoulders with people who need Jesus Christ. And I, I love what uh, over in Acts, Jesus Himself, you know, when He um, after He rose from the dead and spent about forty days with His disciples, He took them up on the Mount of Olives, uh, and He says here in uh, chapter one, it says verse six. And so when they had come together, they were asking Him, Lord, is, is it this time you're restoring the kingdom of to Israel? Is the millennial kingdom going to come now? He says, no, guys, now's not the time for you to know about that. Here's what you need to know about right now at the beginning of the church age, as, as the church is about to begin. 
He said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to go to China to call yourself a missionary. I love what one of my former uh, pastors, the late, great Dr. Norman Geisler, used to say. He said, look, if you, he said, you can't be a missionary across the world if you're not a missionary across the street. In other words, our, our calling to be God's witnesses has to be taken seriously in our Jerusalem. It has to take place in our context, in our own initial uh, hub or, or inner concentric circle. I know when I became a Christian, I was 16 years old. Uh, my, my dear parents uh, were not believers, and, and I was an unchurched person. And so I didn't, you know, we didn't have a church. They didn't have a church. And, and so I came home, and the very first people that I wanted to share the good news with was my mom and dad. And so that's where my, my mission field began with my own family. And look, you know, they didn't uh, they didn't take it too well. <laughs> they, they didn't receive Christ. They didn't fall on their knees. Say, what must I do to be saved? Uh, I just continued to to live uh, as best I could uh, the life of a believer before them. Uh, I'm sure I, I didn't live the best life at times, and they're probably wondering, wow, is that what a Christian's really like? You know, he's not that great of a son sometimes. But you know, just try to do my best. But did it through the power of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said here in Acts chapter 1. And so that's that's the key. That's the first thing you need to know. Not only are you sent already, you've already been sent, but that you're sent primarily and initially at least uh, to your inner circle, wherever God's called you. So, you know, that's, that's why it makes sense, you know, for people to reach people who are like them. Because, you know, I was a hippie. I was a long-haired hippie, you know, uh, played in a band. I just started reaching my hippie friends as best as I could and trying to reach out to my classmates at school. Why? Because they were in my circle. They were in my my Jerusalem uh, and trying to reach out to those people. And then after that, I began to go outside of that and think, well, maybe God could use me in other places as well. So and God will use you in that way, too. But focus in on, first of all, your own inner uh, your own inner Jerusalem. And then you can kind of go in concentric circles uh, out there in the world. And by the way, as you have opportunity uh, to be a witness, maybe, you know, some, some of you guys are maybe witnesses to people online across the world or whatever. Um, but as you have opportunity to do that, then you can see how God can use you outside of that uh, small circle that you once were a part of. Uh, but back here to John chapter 17, he says, <clears throat> uh, as, uh, as I've, uh, as you did send me, Father, I have sent them into the world. Now, I want you to see a parallel passage uh, to what's going on in Acts chapter 1 and, and what relates to this subject here in Matthew chapter 28. And this is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, famously known as the Great Commission. All right. And we love to preach this and we love to talk about this, especially when we talk about missions and that type of thing. But I want you to see something uh, in verse 18. Uh, it begins when Jesus it says he came up means he drew near and he spoke to, to his disciples saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now he's about to commission his disciples to go out into the world. But he begins by saying, I have all the authority to do this. So keep this in mind. Not only are you sent, but you're also sent with the actual authority of God himself. You're not coming in your own name. You're not coming in the name of First Evangelical Church of, you know, Armpit, Alabama, or where, wherever you might live. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what church you come from. You have the authority of heaven itself because you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. So all the authority was given to Jesus. He gave that authority to, to share the message with his disciples. Look what it says. He says, go therefore... And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, uh, even to the end of the age. Now, we focus in on this word go more than anything else in this passage. But when you take it apart in the Greek language, the only direct imperative in this entire passage uh, is this. 
make disciples. Make disciples. The word go uh, is is in the uh, is in a form that means as you're going, <clears throat> as you're going about in your life, make disciples. So what does that do? That that is incredibly liberating to know that. You know why? Because it means you don't have to go anywhere. It means you simply do your life. Jesus says, as you're doing your life, and as you're doing your life, you're going places and that kind of, as you're going, make disciples along the way. You see how natural that is? You see how that doesn't mean, I don't have to get on a plane. I don't have to get in a bus. I don't have to, you know, do all this other stuff. I just need to be myself and go and wherever I go naturally and just wherever I go, shine the light of Christ. Share the truth about Jesus. That's all you have to do. Isn't that freeing to, to, to know that? And so, yes, we hold in high regard those who, <clears throat> who devote their lives to the mission field. Or, and, and I know many that are doing that and praise God. And they're amazing, amazing people. Uh, but you don't have to go there in order to be a missionary, just as you're going. And notice he says to make disciples. In other words, help them become what you are, a disciple, a follower. And how do you do that? Well, it begins by sharing the gospel of Jesus with them. That, again, that they're sinners, that they need Christ, uh, that Christ died for their sin, and that by putting their trust in him and that death on the cross, they can receive forgiveness of sins, they can know the God who made them, and they can live lives with meaning and purpose. And so uh, that's what it means to make disciples. Uh, but he goes on to say that after they become a disciple, that they, are, they follow him in baptism. And this is not a, an option for believers. He says, I want them to be baptized. In other words, I want them to go under that water and come up again. Why? Because that pictures their death to self and they're being resurrected to walk in the newness of life. It pictures the spiritual reality of what happened when we became a Christian. So that's an act of obedience. And then he follows up by saying, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. In other words, don't leave anything out. And that's what I love about the Apostle Paul is that he told the Ephesian elders, I didn't shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Uh, he told the Thessalonians about the apocalypse, uh, eschatology. He told them, about that, told them about that many, many times, in fact. So that's why we study the whole Bible. We study Genesis. We study Revelation. We don't leave anything out. So don't skip over parts to get to parts that you like. Uh, we teach all of the scriptures. And that's what we do here uh, at this on this podcast. Uh, we have now 450, I think this is 456, something like that. 456 different topics and different biblical studies and different uh, prophetic teachings uh, from the Word of God uh, that you know. And then over at The King is Coming, I'm covering a whole nother list of things. And uh, the Prophecy Foes Pros podcast and Jeff Kinley Live on his channel. All these, these are all different. Uh, but we're just covering all different things in the Bible, teaching them to observe or to obey all that I have commanded you. So just know that God has divinely commissioned you. You are a missionary. Congratulations. Where's God sending you today? Uh, where has he placed you already? Uh, where has he already planted you? Be his witness wherever you are. And when you do that, you know what happens? You receive something very special from God. You receive the joy of of knowing you've done what Jesus asked you to do. And nothing beats that. I'll see you next time on the Vintage Truth Podcast. God bless.